Now, the question, I'm not going to go into speculation tonight. I, I just want to introduce a couple of ideas that are in Franklin's uh, articles, because he wrote one in 1729, and then in 1741 he followed up with an uh, essay on paper currency proposing a new method for fixing its value. Now, these are very interesting essays. Both are relatively short, and I think it'd be useful for people to read it, because what it gets at is this question of how a society either builds and develops or goes into self-destruction. It raises issues. Franklin, in 1729, was raising issues that should be discussed on the floor of the Congress today. He starts out in an interesting way, and I think you'll like the opening paragraph. He says, There is no science, the study of which is more useful and commendable than the knowledge of the true interest of one's country. He says it's a science. Now, do you think that is an appropriate conception? Is it science to know the interest of your country? What do you mean by the interest of your country? Think about the kinds of questions that he's posing here. Today, if you were taking a, a, a test and someone said, what is the interest, the number one interest of the United States? Or list the ten most important things for the United States. You'd probably get, if you had a hundred people, you'd probably get a hundred different things. So clearly, there's not much scientific knowledge of this, which was Franklin's point. He says, Perhaps there is no kind of learning more abstruse and intricate, more difficult to acquire in any degree of perfection than this, and therefore none more generally neglected. So he starts out by saying there's a neglect of the study of what's necessary to know about how to improve a country. And he says... Uh, Hence it is that we every day find men in conversation contending warmly on some point in politics, which, although it may nearly concern them both, neither of them understand any more than they do each other. So does he accurately describe the situation today? I mean, every day you see people arguing about stocks and, and uh, money and and whether the United States is, is strong and whether we should cut keep immigrants out because they're undercutting the labor markets. and You hear all kinds of opinions, but how many people actually know a thing about it? In the course of a day's organizing, how many people do you meet who you think really know something and have thought about the question of what is in the true interest of one's country? Do you meet many people like that in your discussions? How about on campuses? You, you, you probably do meet a few people who, who at least are interested in these questions, don't we? I mean, people over 25 really don't give a damn. People over 25 just want to acquire money. They're not all that interested in where it comes from, how it's determined, what it's used for. But what Franklin did in this 1729 paper is raise questions which were at the heart of the fight from 1763 to 1789, and which should be at the heart of the battles today. What is in a nation's interest? How do you build a nation? And in the discussion, he, he discusses questions of how you set the value of money. What should interest rates be? Now, the most interesting thing about this is if you read it, and, and people should, there's a lot that's interesting to it. But it's not really about money. It's about building a nation. You know, I, I read something yesterday that, that some of you may have heard where Franklin was talking about the uh, idiocy of the rich noblemen in Ireland and Scotland. And he compared that to the developments in the American colonies. And he made a point, which is that one of the reasons that people in America live better is that they're not producing goods which they can't consume. He talked about the barefoot Irishmen, or the barefoot Scots, who produce the wool that's used to make socks that are produced and sold somewhere else while they go barefoot. 
He spoke about the Irishmen who live on good land, who produce uh, uh, livestock and other food, which is then taken by the British landowners and sold to other countries while the Irish are left with nothing but potatoes and buttermilk. And we know what happened with that, the great Irish potato famine, when you know potatoes are not the most reliable product crop. And when the potatoes got the potato rot sometime in the early 19th century, hundreds of thousands of people starved to death in Ireland. And the British did nothing to help them. The ones, the Irish that survived, they only, as many survived as did because a lot of them came to the United States. And so Franklin, 60, 70 years earlier, was describing a situation of what happens when your government does not take care to ensure that people have what they need. Take a look today. You know, we can talk about Ireland. and People say, yeah, that's pretty bad. We have our good friend Ingrid Torres here from Mexico. Now, Ingrid could tell you that the same thing is happening today in Mexico, that people who are growing corn, which is the, the most important staple in Mexico, for the uh, tortillas, the tomatoes, people who produce cattle. They ship it to the United States where they can make a little bit more money. But they don't get enough back to replace the food. And so people in Mexico go hungry, except instead of staying in Mexico, they come over here. What is almost 20% of the Mexican population is in the United States? Was that the figures we had, 20-something percent? Yeah. Actually, so it's more, it's closer to 35 percent. Yeah. yeah. About one out of every three Mexican citizens lives in the United States. Now, of course, you got these idiots who want to go down to the border and shoot them. Friends of Arnie Schwarzenegger think that that's going to somehow solve the problem. But when they come over here, is it good for this country? Well, some people say, well, they'll take jobs that normal Americans, i.e. white people, won't take. Or African Americans won't take. Well, that's not really the case. Because if you give them a chance, they'll work at any job. And they'll compete. And they don't use up American services because they're afraid if they go to a hospital, if they hurt themselves, they'll get deported because they don't have papers. And if they're smart, they go back to Mexico for medical care because it's, in some cases it's better in Mexico than here, at least more affordable. So the questions that Franklin was looking at in 1729 and 1741, which had a profound impact with the Irish potato famine because he described exactly the process that led to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Irishmen that if you have landowners who have people at below subsistence living standards producing products that are sold in a so-called free market, and what was the free market then? It was the British Empire. So that the people in Ireland would starve and the landowners would make a little bit of money. And then they would sell the goods in other countries to stop the production of those goods in the other countries. That's free trade. Now, some people say Franklin and, and these guys were free traders. Franklin was just saying he wants fair trade. He wants the right for Americans to produce goods that can be sold at markets. And the British wouldn't let that happen. Why? Because it would undermine the empire. So Franklin then said, well, if you won't let us do that, then we should charge tariffs here. And the British said, you can't do that. Why not? Because you're our colony. You're our subjects. We're making money off your cheap labor and then selling you our products. And so Franklin argued against that. It's the early arguments against free trade, if you go through some of these papers by Franklin. And yet you get people on campuses who are paid $80,000, $110,000 a year to teach students who are paying 30000 a year to go to school to say that Ben Franklin was for free trade. Well, he wasn't. He was asking 
that the American colonies be granted the rights of citizens or subjects of the empire. And when the British said no, finally, Franklin, who had been campaigning for rights of the American colonies, finally Franklin turned around and said, well, we're not going to get these rights, therefore we have to separate. And Franklin was one of the most prestigious of the leaders, a philosopher, a scientist, a well-known scientist. We'll get Frankie in a few minutes to show you some of the kinds of experimental work that Franklin and his collaborators were doing. Some of you may have read about the lightning experiments. You know, Franklin's attempt to determine that lightning is the same as what was called electricity, as opposed to just some spark in the sky. But here was someone who was a giant with tremendous stature who put together a strategy for building a nation. But the key to it was not the idea of separation from Britain. The key to it was how do we ensure the most pleasant, tranquil, and productive life for the people in the American colonies? That was what Benjamin Franklin was concerned about. Now, it raises an interesting question. Is happiness ever based on collecting money? Or cans to get money? <laughs> Have you ever met anyone who collects cans who's happy? <laughs> or the people who take money and go out and buy cans and use them and then throw the cans away no the point is that what Franklin was concerned about was his whole discussion of money and credit was not about possessing goods it was about building a nation and so if you actually look at some of the, the studies that, that are done today about national economy, aggregates, we, we had some exchanges with uh, micro and macro economics professors uh, just two days ago at, at one of the campuses, I guess Fullerton College was it? You know, you begin to discover that while these people know what's in the textbook, the textbook has no real relationship to reality. Because reality is never found in money per se. Depends on what you do with money. Depends on what a government does with the credit it creates. And some of that credit is monetized in the form of dollar bills. Some of the credit does not come out initially as dollar bills. Today, you don't have to do it. You put it on a computer screen. You know, if you're lending money, if you buy a car and you go to a car dealer and they give you a loan, you never get the dollars in your hand and then give it to the car dealer and then sign something talking about how you're going to pay that back to them. There's no exchange of money or dollar bills. And so the question that Franklin is addressing here is really the question that we've got to fight to get through in the Senate today and get through to, to members of the House of Representatives, which is to understand what is the nature of credit. Now, Lynn differentiates between money and credit and a monetary system, a monetary system which is largely the regulation and circulation of, of money, as opposed to a credit system which makes credit available, which eventually will be monetized because the idea of a credit System. Suppose you set up credits to build something. Well, eventually you have to pay people to build it. You have to buy the parts and the equipment that's needed for the building. So eventually a bank has to produce money to have this process carried through. But the process is initiated and generated through the circulation of credit. And credit is something in the United States in the old days, could only be generated by the Congress and the government, the Congress acting on behalf of the government. Now today, how many, how many different ways can you get credit? What are some of the ways you can get credit today? Credit card, what else? Bank loan, what else? Refinance your home. Play gamble on your home. Hedge funds. Hedge funds. 
can get staked at a poker table. Get some credit for that. Derivatives. There are a lot of ways to get credit today. Now, who is making sure that there's something equitable about this credit system? Government agencies. So if I loan you 20 bucks to go out and play poker, what government agency is regulating that? Hmm? Isn't like insuring your, uh... Oh, it's credit, all right. I'm giving you some money based on the expectation you're going to pay me back or else. <laughs> That's credit. Like formal or... Well, formal institutions. But do you realize who regulates derivatives, for example, the, what's called the over-the-counter derivatives, which is hundreds of billions of dollars? Who's, re who's watching that? No, they're not watching. You know, it's it's actually there's more regulation if I loan you twenty dollars and I say to you, Tonya, you're going to pay this back or else. That's more regulated than if you ran a hedge fund and you you got people to, to throw in ten million dollars and then you ended up leveraging that up to a billion dollars and use that billion dollars to buy some stock in a company which you then use to take over the company and shut it down and, and dismantle it. There was no guarantee you'd ever pay that back. Maybe by dismantling the company, you'll make the money to pay it back. That's what Kerkorian does. That's what these vulture funds do. But there's no regulation. Trillions of dollars change hands. And nobody knows how much really is changing hands. And what happens if those bets go wrong? Well, we saw the Japanese stock market lose $300 billion worth of value in the last two days. The last two days, $300 billion was wiped off pe people's portfolios. If you had money in the Nikkei, if you had this inner door or whatever the hell the name of the company is, an internet portal company, it fell 40% in value. Its stock fell 40% in value. So if you had $100 worth of stocks yesterday, today it's worth $60. Gone. Were you going to ask a question, Eric? Yeah. Gone overnight. You know, if you look at the, the, uh, NIC, uh, the um, uh, NASDAQ, in March 2000, it was at 5,200. By March 2001, it was down to 1,800. So if you had $5,200, or let's say you had $5.2 million on paper, and the stocks you owned in, in NASDAQ-listed companies, that would have gone down to $1.8 million within a year. You would have lost $3.4 million. Now, what happens to that money? Where does it go? <laughs> what does it mean to lose money? If I give Tonya this dollar bill and he walks out the door and it falls out of his pocket and he later tries to get it, he knows he's lost a dollar. And he'd probably be pretty angry about it. <laughs> you know, with inflation, Beethoven once wrote a, a, a nice little piece called Rage Over a Lost Penny. So, you know, you can imagine... Uh, you know, Tanya rage over a lost dollar. <laughs> but some people can lose $3 million like that or the, the Japanese $300 billion like that. And as far as I know, there weren't mass suicides in Tokyo today. There might have been. We'll find out. Check, check out the... Uh, we'll get our Japanese financial analyst over here to check out the... Uh, <laughs> Yomiuri Shinbum in the morning and let us know whether there were a lot of harikari actions uh, because of what happened in the stock market. But this is what Franklin's talking about. So why does Franklin say we need paper money? Well, there are two reasons. One is so you can have a paper trail. One is you can know something about what's going on. But more importantly, the government can issue credit above and beyond something it actually has in value. Now, I just want to show you one thing that I want you to think about in terms of 
modern banking. Because you'll see how screwy this gets, and you'll see why it's sometimes difficult to figure out. We have a... All right, let's just say this is a bank. And half of its money is in loans, and half of it is in savings. So let's just say they have $20 million in loans. So they have given $20 million out to people. Now, is that a plus or a minus for the bank? In accounting terms, plus. Why? Why is that considered an asset? Yeah, that is if I loan $20 million to the people in this room, besides being certifiably insane, <laughs> technically I would be saying I'm really rich because these guys are going to pay that back plus interest. Now, meanwhile, you have $20 million in the other part of the bank of money going in in savings, certificates of deposit. Now banks can sell... Um, they can get your money in lots of different ways. But anyway, now, the money they have in the bank, that seems to be good, right? Is it? Yes. Why is it good? Hmm? Because it's money. Because it's money? <laughs> Why is money in the bank good? Well, yeah, you, right, you, the bank pays interest, right? So if some guy gives the bank money, the bank owes the person money. This is a negative. Doesn't that seem backwards? Yeah. Well, can't they invest, invest in markets with their Well, we'll get to that in a moment. Because then you really see how screwy the system is. <laughs> the money, you would think it's good for banks to take in money, but it's not because they have to pay out more for that. They make more money by giving it away. So the flow of money is the positive, the flow of money out is the positive. The flow of money in is considered the negative. So what do they do with the money that comes in? I mean, some of it, they turn around and loan out. Some of it they invest. Banks are now allowed to invest money. It used to be the banks weren't allowed to do that. But under deregulation, they're allowed to do it. So what do you think starts to happen? Their loan portfolio goes up and the amount of money they have on hand shrinks. And so it looks like the positive is growing like crazy, and they're trying to shrink the negative. Because people don't, how many people today have savings accounts? Or why put money in a bank? I mean, a bank pays 1.8 or 2.4%. So you can't really make much money. So what's happening with these banks is that the amount of money they're giving out in order to be profitable, goes up. And the amount they're taking in shrinks. Now, what does that ultimately mean? They're totally dependent on having a healthy economy so the people they're loaning money to can pay it back. And in a good economy, that's what happens. That banks are making loans that are improving the community, they're making loans that go into industry, that are creating jobs, and things of that sort. Now, is that what's happening today? Anyone know? Do you have any idea? Well, it doesn't. that's not what's happening today. They're loaning money out to people who may not be able to pay it back. They're making loans for people to buy houses whose assessed value is way up. But, you know, I mean, take a simple example. You buy a house 20 years ago on the street, you know, up this street here, Philion. 20 years ago, you buy it for $20,000. Today, you sell it for 300000 Is the house better today than it was 20 years ago? No. <laughs> These houses, you know, you're lucky if the window still opens and closes. So why is it so much more valuable? So the banks keep loaning more and more money so people can buy more and more expensive houses with the expectation that they'll pay back the money with interest. Does that happen? Well, the delinquency rates, that is the rates at which people are paying back the, the loans, 
are, the delinquency rates are growing. So that means they're loaning more money, but they're getting less back. The whole banking system is that way. The amount of bad loans in the banking system is what has caused what LaRouche calls the imminent bankruptcy of the whole banking system. Now, one might then say, well, credit's a bad thing then, isn't it? We shouldn't loan money. Is that a legitimate conclusion? No, no. Why not? Because when you're talking about long-term credit, you can then institute the means at which that can pay for itself. Long-term credit? Are you nuts? I've got to cover things tomorrow. What if Aaron comes in and demands his $47.12 savings bond be, be paid? <laughs> i got to have cash on hand. Long-term loans, some guy's going to pay me back 40 years from now, I'll probably be dead. That's how bankers think today. I need something that will return money tomorrow. Like, I'm going to do a derivative bet on Tim Vance's VW. I'll bet he doesn't sell it tomorrow. Anyone want to take that bet? Not my action, opposite action. No, I mean, this is what happens in banking. We need some cash. How are we going to get some cash? <laughs> Someone's going to come in and demand their money be repaid. Where are we going to get the money from you? The, if you have long-term loans, you may never get them repaid. That's the way bankers think these days. So they take even more out of the savings and invest them in wildly speculative things called hedge funds. Banks and hedge funds are virtually the same thing right now. Who's the largest investor in hedge funds in the United States? Anyone know? Citicorp. Yeah, Citicorp. Mm. Who's second? Bank of America. I think it's Morgan. Mm. So the two biggest banks in the country have a huge amount of your savings and your CDs tied up in hedge funds. Now that's called unregulated monetary policy. You going to ask a question, George? Yeah, with doesn't the hedge funds and the interest, like, aren't they collecting a certain amount of, like, large amounts of capital, like, financial money? Yeah, because they're going in and they're buying up a German machine tool shop and selling off its parts and making money on it. But they're killing the economy, which produced the, the potential for money in the first place. They realize that, though, right? Well, some of them do. You think Kirk Kerkorian wants to build better cars for General Motors? There was a guy years ago named T. Boone Pickens. He's a Texas oilman. T. T. Boone Pickens, that's his name. It's not, it's not T. Bone. That's one of Mike Vandernat's favorite singers, T. Bone Pickens. But T. Boone Pickens, he had a theory. He would go in and buy up independent oil companies that had discovered deposits of oil. You know why? He said, it's cheaper for me to buy up the companies that already discovered things than to pay to have someone go out and find oil. You get that logic? You get someone else who's a real entrepreneur who goes out and finds an oil well and he doesn't have enough money to, to bring it in. And so Boone Pickens was waiting there to loan him money and then foreclose on it and get the oil well. And the other guy did all the work. And it worked so well, he started going after companies like Conoco. Big oil companies. That's the one I'm, I'm thinking of now, Penn something or other. Pennzoil, the one that was Pennzoil. He tried to take that over. And he did something called, an interesting thing called green mail. Because no one wanted T. Boone Pickens to, on their board of directors. He was a real rough, rough kind of guy. So what they would do is he would go in and buy a bunch of stock. And he'd say, I want to be on your board of director, directors. <laughs> and they'd say, uh, well, we don't want you. And maybe he bought all the stock at $30 a share. He would say, I'll tell you what, you give me $45 a share and I'll skedaddle out of here. But if you don't, I'm going to buy more stock till I own the company. And they'd 
give them money. It was called green mail. Yeah. That's why Lynn says a monetary system is the basis for fraud as opposed to a credit system where the banks actually do, to take the example Tanya used, they do their asset and uh, debit ratios based on their expectations that the loans they're making will have long-term value as opposed to short-term speculative value. And that's what Franklin understood. Franklin understood that you have to have an economy which organizes itself around the idea that wealth ultimately, here's the irony, you use paper currency, but the value of paper currency is not in the paper, but in the potential production that it can stimulate and create. And so in a sense, these, these are valuable if you need a, a Coke or a yogurt or something like that, but they have no intrinsic value. And money itself, as credit, only has value to the extent that it builds an economy. And that's the point Franklin makes. And it's worth reading his arguments to get a good sense of how far ahead he was uh, in his thinking. And secondly, the, or secondly, how these ideas became the ideas of the American Constitution. And third, why we can say without any fear of contradiction that most people who call themselves economists today are idiots who play around with formulas and equations and with the wealth of nations to the detriment of those countries. So that's really all I wanted to go over. If, if there's some questions or some things people want to kick around. Otherwise, I do want Frankie, who's well prepared now, to do one of his uh, Ben Franklin experiments. <laughs> so, yeah, Tim. Yeah. Occasionally, when you're organizing uh, at a table, you'll you'll stop someone and they'll seem very interested and they'll, they'll might ask a few questions about the financial system. But then they always come on to you with an offer, like you're you're a bright young individual. Here, I work with this up and coming company, and it's like Primericor, and then like uh, World. You ever run into Ameriquest? Uh, some, something, yeah. but um, <laughs> what? And you, you ask them about it, and it's like you can get into the financial world, and you help, uh, you know, help yourself uh, by helping low-income families, <laughs> middle-income families, right? And the thing is, the people who are sponsoring this, like uh, I don't know if you've heard of like Aegon, some Netherlands-based company, like how are they profiting? Like what is the? How are they profiting by supporting these types of? Well, let me tell you about AmeriQuest, because okay. that's one that's based in L.A., and that's the, one of the largest contributors to Schwarzenegger. And they are wonderful people who are helping poor people finance homes. Aren't they part of Citigroup, right? Hmm? Aren't they part of Citigroup, AmeriQuest? Well, they may be now. They're basically, if you want to see them in a couple of months, you'll have to go to Folsom, though. They're all going to jail. Because here's what AmeriQuest does. They go out and they find people who have jobs, who barely make enough. In this city, as some of you know, uh, real estate is not cheap. Apartments, you know, simple studio apartments are not cheap. It's very difficult to get a place to live. And if you're just starting out, maybe you have a wife and a kid and you both are working, you might make enough money to make a payment for owning property. What, what these do, they go to people who can't really afford, with the old standards, they can't afford to own a home. But they say, this is George Bush's America. Everyone can own a home. We're going to put you in a house. So you own a piece of the country. You know, this Bush's thing is uh, more Americans own homes. You know, it's more banks and mortgage, fly-by-night mortgage companies own homes. <laughs> and what they do is they say, we'll come up with the money for your down payment and then we'll structure an agreement so that it will fit within the amount of money you make. And they usually use this thing of 25 to 30% of your salary has to go to payment. So the first two or three years, you know, people, you get a guy who barely uh, is surviving, and you say to him, you sign this, it's really good. You only have to pay $300 a month, and you can own your own home. 300 a month. Wow, that's great. And it's something called interest only. 
or they have four or five or six different forms of these loans where the first year or two or three of your payments are relatively low. Now, meanwhile, you're living in a house that you couldn't afford if you had to pay a regular standard mortgage. So the value of the house goes up because someone's living in it. And after you get beyond the interest only, now you have to start paying interest in principal. Instead of 300 a month, it goes up to 800 a month. And your utilities have gone up, your taxes have gone up, and suddenly you realize that you got swindled. And what AmeriQuest does is they've kept all the money you've paid. And since it's interest only, if the house was 100000 you still owe $100,000. Plus the interest over the 15 or 30-year mortgage. So instead of owing the 100000 you may have paid, say you paid 350 a month for three years. That's gone. You have no equity. The house you're living in, you can't afford to stay. They can throw you out, and now the value of the house has gone up on paper. And they own it. Plus, they've gotten your money. So how does that help people? It helps the guy who sold it. The guy who owns it gave uh, $360,000 to Schwarzenegger. So Schwarzenegger's people who are supposed to regulate these things are sitting down at lunches fancy-ass lunches to, to schmooze with them. They're not regulating them. That's what a lot of these... Primeric is another one. You know, they basically go in and swindle people. Under regulated banking, you used to not be allowed to do that. You know, if someone didn't have enough money because of their job to pay a loan on a mortgage, you'd have to say to them, I'm sorry, we can't structure something for you. You're going to have to keep renting or get three more jobs. So, you know, when someone says something like that to you, there are people who have bought into an illusion. And a number of the executives, the guy who runs it isn't going to go to jail. He's, he's saying he didn't know this was going on. He would never have structured things this way. It's like Ken Lay saying, I didn't know what they were doing. I was just the front man, the Ken Lay at Enron. You know what? You know how many jurors are going to believe that? In Texas, probably most of them. <laughs> but you know what? He's going to go to jail. He's, they're going to have Ken Lay and Tom D. Lay in adjoining jail cells somewhere in Texas. Are, are there investigations underway on, on these types well, of Well, AmeriQuest was being investigated out of New York State. Elliot Spitzer, who's a very ambitious guy who's running for governor of New York, because they, they extended their business into New York which they never should have done because New York actually believes that the state is supposed to help people, whereas in California, under the Arnie Schwarzenegger regime, the purpose of the state is to make cartel owners rich. Any other questions? Yes. Um, well, good bankers don't, yeah, okay. but there aren't very many of them anymore. Well, I, I wouldn't put it that way. I, I think what you have to look at is a 40-year deliberate destruction, deconstruction of the regulatory agencies that were set up at the end of uh, the Depression. Franklin Roosevelt, as president, built up through the Congress a whole series of regulations to protect people from the kind of stuff we were just talking about with AmeriQuest. That they, the only banks that could loan for home mortgages were called savings and loan banks. And they would keep interest rates low by being granted something called Regulation Q, which was a right to ensure they would have a profit. You'd figure out what would the delinquency rate be, how many people could pay, and they could loan money at uh, 3% or 6%, a 
they'd loan it at 6% and they'd get, give 3% interest. They'd make money. People would be able to buy houses. Everyone was happy. Now, small profits aren't what Wall Street likes. And so Wall Street fought to deregulate everything. The railroads, the airlines, the housing business, the banking industry, and so on. And once you took away the regulations, then the most unscrupulous people could get in and say, let's see how much we can make. The best example of this, when people get angry and say, oh, that's not really what they're doing, is it? best example is Enron. Read the transcripts of Timothy Belden, the leading Enron trader of electricity for California in 2001. Belden and his associates sit there and say, we're going to stick it to Grandma Millie. They say, let's call up the plant down the road and tell them to shut off their electricity production today. Yeah, that sounds like fun. It's like Beavis and Butthead having a conversation. These guys were fools. They were evil fools who basically said, let's see how much we can charge. Duke Energy, I'll give you an example. It used to be $35 a megawatt hour before 2000 in California. It went up to $300 per megawatt hour. Duke Energy said, let's see how hard we can, how high we can push it. They charged $3,785 a megawatt hour. The same megawatt hour, six months before you paid $30 for, you're now paying $3,685. Was it better electricity? Did it come to your house with bells and whistles? <laughs> no, it was called a ripoff. Now, that's what they teach at business school. I, I've been reading a book because I'm going to write a review of this crappy book on Enron by a guy named Eichenwald. And there's a book called Infectious Greed by a guy who's a professor at UCSD. We should go see him sometime we're there. And he writes about what they started doing. I think I told you some of this. It starts with the, the mentality. The people they would hire at places like uh, Goldman Sachs would be people who, if you take a dollar bill and you look at the serial number. And this one ends with 3339. And they would start betting with each other whether a bill had an odd or an even number. And they do it with $100 bills. Now, you're going to e either be right or wrong. I mean, it's a 50-50 chance. You know, with my luck, you'd probably be wrong 10 straight times and be out of grand. But... Someone who's supposed to be a sober guy who's handling people's money does that for fun? Can you imagine that? Now, what do you think they came up with? They came up with derivatives. They came up with securitized mortgage markets where you bundle all these mortgages together and you sell them off to some bigger sucker. They came up with things, some ideas, swaptions, futurons, Things that have no meaning. And they got people to buy them. They got banks to put up money for them. The whole economy of the 90s, the so-called economic boom under Clinton, was a fraud. It was based on this kind of delusional playing around with money. And then part of it popped in 1997. Another part popped in 98. Another part popped in March 2000, the Internet bubble. Now we've still got the housing bubble, and we've got a mini stock bubble. But what are we doing? We're losing the auto industry. We're losing the airline industry. We're, we're losing virtually every major productive enterprise in the United States. The price of gold has gone from $360 an ounce to $570 an ounce in about a year and a half. Same ounce of gold. Oil has gone from $30 a barrel to $67 a barrel. Why? Because we're not producing. So when people say, you know, things like, well, the, the government has the form but not the substance, they've destroyed government. And they put the biggest moron they could find in the country into the presidency <laughs> who doesn't know that it's being destroyed. He thinks it's progress. You know, it's like the guy who's got a chart where it shows profits going down like this, but he's standing on his head so it looks like it's going up. That's Bush. <laughs> he doesn't know up from down. So that's the problem we've got. That's why Franklin's concept of credit is 
a sound concept. So I'm going to stop because I want Frankie to uh, shock some people. <laughs> if you haven't seen this, you should come up front and Frankie will explain to you what Benjamin Franklin figured out about the ability to store electricity. Okay. <laughs>